We'll try to get through this analysis of First Peter. So the question we're wanting to explore is how is that word apologia used in the Bible? So we can maybe learn um, from that. So I'm just going to go through these scriptures. You can study them out more carefully. Um, Acts 22, Paul gets up there and he basically is speaking to his defense. He says, brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. That word apologia is defense. You have in uh, Acts 25, 16, again, this is Paul uh, saying, I told them it's not the Roman custom to hand over anyone before they have faced the accusers and have had an opportunity to defend themselves against the charges. So again, apologia has this legal aspect, it's like a, like a courtroom language. But notice in 2 Corinthians 7, we may be more familiar with the scripture, uh, the worldly sorrow, godly sorrow scripture. It says, see what this godly sorrow has produced in you, what earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves. That's that Greek word apologia, which I thought was interesting. And he carries on what indignation and alarm and so on. So in, in this sense, the clear yourself is not a, it's more of an informal, it's not a legal, like a courtroom scene, but it's an informal uh, experience. Nonetheless, it's very much about telling the truth or of having, um, having, it's a no spin zone. You're not trying to manipulate the narrative. You're just saying what happened. You're clearing yourself. They, they're just coming clean. In Philippians 1 verse 7, Paul says, It's right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. And whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. Again, this is that word of apologia. Um, but notice what happens to Paul. He's, so he's sharing his faith. He's, he's presenting the gospel. He ends up in jail. Uh, in, first, in Philippians 1.12, he says, I want you to know what has happened to me as actually it served to advance the gospel. So again, this is not just rational debate. I think that's what I'm trying to highlight. The effect of apologia in Paul's case and many people's cases is prison. And so apologetics embodies the way of King Jesus. And we'll explore this more in our subsequent sessions. I have a whole section on the character of the apologist. And it's so essential. So apologia, we looked at the social kind of use of the word or, or experience of the word, we're seeing that it could be a formal or informal case being made. We also looked at how it embodies the way of the king, which shouldn't surprise us when we go sharing of our faith. It's not just about what we say, it's how we say it. Do we have the love of Christ as we are sharing the gospel of Christ? Now continuing on with the canonical analysis, Now, this section, honestly, would be much better without the PowerPoint. I think PowerPoint really kind of restricts the flow of this section, but I'll do my best. <laughs> but I want you guys to think of the story, because this is a narrative section, and PowerPoints generally are not really good with narratives. They're just good with putting out information. Um, but I want us to think about this word redeem. Uh, in First Peter 1, 18, Peter says, for you know it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without uh, blemish or defect. This word redeem, in fact, the whole of 1 Peter, if you really step back, and I hope you have read it, it's a fascinating letter. It, it's, it's brilliant. And did you notice how Peter talks about being redeemed, then he talks about living a holy life. When you hear the word redeemed, what narrative, what story comes to your mind? What biblical story comes to your mind? Sorry? The cross. The cross? What, what other story comes to mind? Um, Exodus. Exodus. Redeem Exodus. Immediately it's about Exodus. Now, 
that's why the PowerPoint's not really helpful, but I'll go through it. But think of the people of God in Exodus. We, we did this in the Old Testament survey. Uh, they, they are now in Egypt, they're enslaved, they get rescued by God's mighty hand, and God forms a community. And then in Leviticus, he gives them, how, he gives them instructions on how to live as God's people. Right? And, and then they're sojourning, they're traveling from Egypt to go to live in Canaan with the Canaanites. We're going to discuss God and war, and we'll look at Joshua specifically. Uh, but within this narrative, the people of God going from in prison, enslavement in Egypt, to now living in, in Canaan with other people, and God's people are called to live a certain lifestyle to show the people in Canaan what it means to be the people of God. That's kind of the grand narrative. Now what, look what happens to First Peter. Um, in Exodus 6, we have this redeemed language. In Exodus 6, verse 6, Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. As I mentioned, years after Exodus comes Leviticus. I am the Lord your God, Le Leviticus 11.44. Consecrate yourselves, be holy, because I am holy. Do not make yourselves unclean by any creature that moves along the ground. And it goes into this holiness code. But it's really about God setting apart His people that He has redeemed. 1 Peter 1.16 Be holy because I am holy. Peter is teaching his God's people who are now living as exiles, which we'll get to in just a minute, in the Roman provinces, saying, now you are in this land as my people. I want you to live set-apart lifestyle because you're my people. Notice the order of things. It's not so they can be God's people. It's because they're God's people. Because they're redeemed, they live the redeemed lifestyle. So redemption results in redeemed people formation. That's what happened in the, in the Torah. That's what's happening in First Peter. You guys with me? Is this story making sense or this narrative? Again, it it reminds me again. I I would love to do a thousand page book on the Torah and the New Testament. That that if it ever happens, may may God open that door. But I, I I'm reading First Peter and immediately it's like wow, there's so much of the Torah in this in in First Peter. Because, of, again, it's community formation. God forming His people that He has redeemed. Now, again, back to the question, where are they living? They're living in Roman province of Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithyni, Bithynia. So, again, just like in Exodus, and I just said this, you know, God's people in Exodus leave Egypt to Canaan. God's redeemed, renewed people of all nations are living in, quote-unquote, Canaan. The, the Cappadocia and, the, and in these Roman provinces. And so again, Leviticus 18 verse 3, God tells His people that He has redeemed from Egypt. Do not do what they did in Egypt where you used to live and you must not do as they do in the land of Canaan where I'm bringing you. So there's a sojourning happening from Egypt, no longer in Egypt, now in Canaan, but you can't do what Egypt did, you can't do what Canaan does. First Peter 2, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans where, where you are living that they, may, they, that they accuse you of doing wrong, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us, they, they heap abuse on you. Again, notice this is not just about ethics. It's, it's not about Christian ethics versus non-Christian ethics. This is about a new time and new space. God's people are in a new time. They're in the redeemed time. And no longer in Egypt, but in God's new creation, which is... Here, but not fully. So, this is why this is so important. Apologetics, and I was thinking about this. 
For example, there's an apologetic question, is Jesus the only way? I'm sure you've been asked or you've thought about this or you may have watched some video debates. The problem with asking that question and then we go into answers of yes, no or whatever is we fail to actually explore the question itself. When, it's a, when we ask, is Jesus the only way, the question is way to where? It's actually a complex eschatological question and we just oversimplify it for whatever reason and then we fight with each other. <laughs> You know, it's like, why is he the only way? Why can't it be this? Why can't it be that? We're like, no, we're missing the whole point. The story is about God's creation rebelling against God and God redeeming his creation. And Peter is writing to these in exile. And we'll, we'll get to that in just a minute. It's a loaded, it's brilliantly composed. It's, it, it's, it, it's, it's imagination is absolutely incredible. Like we can sit on this just imagining the word exile and why is it being used and, and it can absolutely just tr incredibly transformative and inspiring. It's not a debate, it's actually an invitation to a new worldview. Does that make sense? Again, is Jesus the only way? Well, let's unpack that. Way to where? And, and it, the more you unpack it, it actually so hopefully it really helps us to fall in love with Jesus more. But exile, let's talk about exile. Again, a PowerPoint is not the best way to present this material, I think. But I have to, because um, going back to the Old Testament, exile is a result of covenant disobedience. You can read that in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, because the, the covenant is repeated in Deuteronomy. Um, but no, notice what happens, and, and I just picked the one in Babylon. Um, but the same thing happened in, in Assyria also. Um, but here's Nebuchadnezzar, the commander of the God, carried into exile the people who remained in the city. So this is people in Jerusalem being taken into exile for their covenant failure. So they exiled from the promised land to Babylon. And this happened in, give or take, well, it happened a few times, uh, from 601 to probably 586 BC or so. You know, it is, there's... Uh, a few exile, um, few yeah, exile groups that went out. Then they come back. They come back. For, this happens 539 BC in the first year of King Cyrus of Persia. Um, he sends back a group of exiles back to the Promised Land. Okay, so you got to now transport yourself back in time. So people of God went into exile, and they come back from exile. But in Malachi, which is written probably a few hundred years after the first batch comes back from exile, here's what the prophet says to the people who are now back in the promised land, but something's missing. Noticeably, God is missing because he says, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant, whom you desire will come. So God's people are back in the land. So now in one sense, exile is over. But on the other hand, God did not come back to live with his people in the land. Notice what happens in 1 Peter 4. Peter says, if you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. You guys with me here? So in, in the Old Testament, return from exile happens, but God doesn't dwell among his people like he did in Exodus and also in the first temple in 1 Kings 6. But now Peter is writing to these disciples of Jesus Christ living in different parts of the Roman province saying the Spirit of God actually is with you. So God with his people, but still in exile. How does this work? Well, if you think of it in terms of new creation, these are the one family of all nations living in new creation, which is here, but not fully here. So in one sense, new creation is here, but in another sense, they're still in exile in the Roman province. Again, apologetics sits within that narrative. 
you take it outside that narrative, then it just becomes about intellectual, um, uh, intellectual prowess. Who is smarter than who? That's what it comes down to. This guy has read, he's got three PhDs, he's, got read, he's read this, that, the other thing. He can take out anybody, or he or she, not to, to be gender, ne gender neutral here, it could be a woman with three PhDs, right? And then it just becomes about that. I'm just smarter than you. I'll destroy you in arguments. This is about some new thing God's doing within which apologetics sits. We have to explain this. Is this making sense? Yeah. So apologetics is the why you, in bracket, the people of God, are the way you are. Again, Christian ethics sits within this narrative. On a side note, it's, it's really, we got to be careful when we do quote-unquote character studies with teens. Please, be careful, because we're not teaching them Christian ethics. Because honestly, Every religion has their own ethics. I grew up Hindu. I had ethics. My parents taught me not to do stuff and whatever. Uh, so again, it's, 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 a fall, it's a fallacy to think only Christians have ethics and all the other people live this non-ethical lifestyle. That's not true. That's actually a f completely false. This is an ethical living. This is a call to be, in, be participants in new time, new space reality. Apologetics sits there. Apologetics only makes what sense it makes within the redemptive reconciliation narrative. And we'll see this more and more as we um, doing this do, throughout the day. Please remember this. This is vital. Otherwise, again, like I said, it, it reduces this to just pure intellectual proverbs. Who is smarter than who? Again, it's not about God versus science. We, we can be, make it that, and we'll talk through this. It can become about God versus gender. It can, be, be, it can become about God versus whatever. But in what God is doing, the, the new time and space that God has unleashed in the midst of the old, it transforms, really, science, gender, everything is new and has to be seen with new lens.